it takes three days to do a complete test. And uh, with two testers, I found uh, in one day, well, less bugs, but then it was okay as well. Well, if I'm from a company perspective and I have to make the decision often, are we going to continue with the software and it's tested today, then I have the two testers. So the timing was an issue. We use in our company an, a complete DevOps pipeline. So we build every night our software, we release it to the test environments, and we want to know the results in the next morning. So that's one of the most important reasons uh, to dockerize it, because if the, if Testar is going to work for three days, I don't have time to work for three days on the software, uh, on the test results, then my developers are doing a lot of other things in the meantime. Um, so, the, the main reason is just to limit time, uh, have minimized resources. Uh, setting up a lot of virtual machines takes a lot of effort. Uh, it can be done automatically, but still then it takes a lot of effort. So uh, a Docker image is just a minimized image of the tester software, including a Chrome version and a driver so it can execute it. Um, the image I created is published on the Docker Hub. And I create the image using as well a pipeline, but that's only just for setting it up. Afterwards, you can just use it. That's the nice thing about Docker. You create an image. This is your complete software, and you pull it and deploy it. In my case, it's very easy. We build Testar, and we pu uh, publish it to this container repository. From that point on, uh, it's there. And we can start with the testar itself. In my testar, uh, I use Kubernetes. And Kubernetes, uh, I use Kubernetes because a simple Docker image is often meant to run one instance. So you run one instance of the software and, and you wait for the results or it runs forever or it's just a server part or whatever. Um, in uh, Kubernetes, it is the ability to schedule over many nodes, so many servers itself, uh, Docker images. So you can specify how many uh, images you want to have. And in the end, uh, you want to store the results on the central location. Um, you want to have the uh, Orient database on a cert certain location. So all the containers are writing in, into the same database. And we have uh, the next question for my research will as well be to integrate the different states of uh, the virtual of the Docker images. So they don't do the same things. When I have 550 images running and my images are all doing exactly the same, then it's kind of useless to run them at all because one would have been surface, one would have been enough. Um, so I, the next question for the research will be how to create a state model which is shared between all the different images. And another important aspect is the logging. We're not going to read uh, log files from 50 or 100 or 500 Docker images. It's useful, useless. So um, what I propose for that uh, solution is an uh, extension I also made already. Uh, that is that we implemented end unit logging. And end unit logging can be just uh, read by uh, DevOps services. So you can execute it. Testar will write all its logs to a central location. And afterwards you say, okay, my time is up. Collect all the logs from the log location and publish them to the DevOps. So we have a uh, result. That's the final goal. And furthermore, in our case, uh, we have a lot of registration processes we want to test and fill uh, form filling uh, processes uh, where an end user has to specify some information. Um, for that part, we will also as well, I will as well add a, a specific part. Um, in Kubernetes, it's very easy. Uh, well, easy. It depends on how you look at it. Kubernetes doesn't have a uh, user-friendly uh, user interface where you can say, well, create a virtual machine for me, and I want to have 8 gigs of memory, and I want a hard disk of this size and uh, this operating system. It's completely specified. Infrastructure as a service. So we have API version. Uh, this is all Kubernetes related. And um, are you I going to go share it on screen or? Sorry, didn't I? Nope. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, so far it's been uh, your. Um... If it's uh, if it was Sorry, terrible, okay, then I already showed. 
I also <laughs> showed a lot of things already. Uh, create a uh, then I start from the Docker image. The Docker image I create is done like this. Just have a build agent, get the, gather the Kubernetes and uh, the test our software, and create a Docker image, and put it in this container, and that's it. So that's the complete Docker part for the building itself. So that one will be published in Docker uh, Hub, and we can use it. Then we have an uh, orient uh, data uh, to Kubernetes. As I was telling, Kubernetes doesn't have a very user-friendly interface. If I want to create something, I have to hear the plus button. That's all. So that won't be very useful. Um, I've made is as well a uh, description file about the infrastructure as it should be. And that will be deployed. Uh, that can be added to the plus. And uh, this file will be supplied as well. So it will be set on uh, the repository so it can be used and uh, modified for the own users because for example this is my specific machine my output my settings directories um, the rest of it is here's the image mentioned where it, where it gets it from docker hub and uh, of course the parallelism i have a machine with 32 gigs of memory but i have probably used already a lot so i'm just only going to use five instances in my case we can show it anyway. And when so we basically want now you're you're running the whole system on your laptop, right? Yes, I'm running it completely on my laptop. So I have five instances of of of, of Testar, and I only have well, that's also nice to know, not even ten gigs of memory. I'm going to run five Testar images and an Orient database. The Orient service is no, the Orient service will won't be deployed. Um, settings locations are all shared on a network file share. Okay, now I have the uh, task, and directly it starts creating five tester images. It's now creating, and now it's already running, and we can look in it. When the image starts, uh, it's the same as when you start in a Docker. This will be the welcome text. It will give some uh, clues about the settings you have to set because you don't have any form of user uh, interface. This is all. Um, in, the, in the end, there is running a Chrome in this image, but we won't see it. It's completely hidden for us. All five images are running right now. We can exit into it. So now we get in such an image. And we're going to look what's going on. And we see at this moment that it's running Chrome, the Chrome driver and a Chrome instance. All the images are doing the same at this moment. Then I have network share where I set my uh, output and I started at 938. That's probably correct. Yes, server time is not uh, exact. Uh, and from this point, uh, we can look at the logs. And this is the first log, didn't do anything yet. Second one. Third one, that one already has an image. I'm unfortunately on Wi Fi and uh, it's using the same, uh, everything is used. Uh, so the testing. On my laptop is done all over the same connection as we have to gather the images from the network. So it can be a bit slow. And this is a VPN as well. And at this moment, it's still running. We can look here in the jobs. The job is still running, two minutes. The pods are all five running right now. In the meantime, I can show the settings. Normally uh, in uh, Testar, you have the settings uh, in, the, in the user interface, but they are stored on disk as well. And there is a protocol file. The protocol file should be on a central location as well, as well as the settings. So all the nodes know where to get the uh, specific uh, configuration from. 
because there is no configuration in your pod, nothing. It doesn't make any sense to have any configuration in your pod. Uh, a pod, by the way, is uh, a Docker instance. It's called a pod in uh, Testar. Um, having configuration in it doesn't make any sense because then you can't configure it at all. We have test settings open with. This is the uh, tester test tool in the uh, test settings. In the image itself, there is a Chrome driver always available. We test for 15 sequence length. The REN database in a cluster, you can use this. So it will deploy it, but the database itself will always have a, a name which is already pre-configured. So even if the database server isn't accessible for us because it's inside an internal protected network, it's still there. Um, and then we have several settings added. Flash feedback is a, a feature which isn't supported on uh, Linux. And I added an additional thing, uh, protocol compile directory, uh, because we can't uh, share the uh, Java file. We can share the Java file, but when every image is writing on the same location, we will have a next problem because everyone is writing the same compiled file. And here you can specify NUnit3 reporting or HTML reporting. And these are the specific settings added for now. It's already completed. We can see in the logs what, what's going on. No problems detected. That's one. Then we have the next image. Second one, no problem detected. The third one, no, no problem detected. The fourth one, neither problem detected. And the fifth one, also not problem detected. We can now refresh the pages. This will probably be complete. Yep, there it is. There is a bug uh, we just discovered in uh, PDF. <laughs> in Chrome, it seems uh, on Linux, there is not a back button when it's opened uh, a PDF. So we can refresh the second one as well. And here it's performing all the different actions on all the different nodes. Uh, this run, this was using um, uh, random action selection, right? Yeah. So the shared uh, database is not yet used. No, the shared database is, is even in, in development. So I'm developing it right now. Yeah. So that's why all the instances click on the same uh, at a certain moment, probably on the privacy statements, and then it gets in its PDF. And um, well, this is uh, it for now. Uh, from no, this isn't it. Um, when the execution is done, it says how long it took, and afterwards you can clean up the job, and uh, then it cleans up as well the pods, and you can upload the results to a central server. So right now it's just going to be removed. There, the job is gone, and the pods are gone. And um, that was. Do you already have the um, way to collect the um, reporting into the back to the yes. demos? Yeah. When you, when normally when you run this, we have a Kubernetes deploy action. We have this one. Then we create a new t uh, t uh, oh, we add a task and we say publish test results add. Then it uh, selects a location, uh, and that's on less less than test test step XML, and now it automatically uh, collects all the files. So normally, when you deploy, first you deploy the software. Plus, we create, for example, deploy. 
IIS or uh, deploy. First, we deploy a website. We, we deployed, uh, then the software is on our website. The next step would be deploy our Kubernetes uh, cluster with the uh, tester image, test it. Then there should be a new task deploy cube. Uh, Command is wait and, uh, for uh, this one. Then we create a new task. Keep uh, it here. Get your test start. We don't know. We don't care, and we delete in the end. And this is how a pipe complete pipeline will look like. So you deploy your website every night. You deploy a, a Kubernetes uh, the test start to the Kubernetes cluster, already knowing where the website is. Then you wait for the uh, till it completes. You delete the job, and you publish the results. Okay. So this yeah. is the, the final release about uh, if you have your own software, you deploy whatever you need. This is just an IIS website. I didn't even know the, I don't have to even the package, but you have the, the complete setup done. Then you add the next four steps to completely test it, deploy it, and upload the results. And I do have uh, already, as well, some XML output. Just wait a second. Oh, I just deleted them. We can run the test again, and then I have to set end unit testing, and then it will re uh, publish uh, XML files. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, at this point, are there any questions from the audience? Because I know there are some DevOps people also in, in the call. Uh, and uh, my idea was that since we have some te technical people also in the call, we could now ask the, also the difficult questions. Um, and they would be then basically, because I'm recording this session, uh, then we have a questions and answer also included. There are a couple of questions. So if I may. Yes. Go ahead. Um, so first question would be, uh, from your experience, what kind of errors uh, Testar finds in that kind of setup? The normal errors it would normally find. <laughs> okay, no, no, um, elaborate a bit more. What kind of what, what is normal errors? I think that's uh, Pekka. Can you answer that question? <laughs> Yeah, because Arendt has not be started yet actually testing the system. So he's, he's still setting up the environment so that he can actually run the tests. Um, whereas uh, we have other uh, other students who have been uh, running it longer. And I, I think I mentioned uh, uh, to you, Madve, already that um, we have one student who has been uh, running it in a in a CI, CI uh, system of, of um, Basically, they, their product is a web application, and they've been running it in the CI already uh, one and a half months, and they found over 1,000 failures with Testar on top of the normal testing they do. So, um, but in that case, uh, this guy was a developer also of the of the system, so he knew from from experience what kind of um, errors they usually see. Basically, 
when they test their own development. So basically, he was able to create really good uh, test oracles for for the star uh, that were were specifically um, done for the framework they used, uh, the web framework uh, or JavaScript framework they used for implementing the website. So he were actually he was um, looking for the specific errors that are typical for that kind of development environment. Okay, yeah, then maybe it will be interesting later on to see the if it's possible to see those oracles. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, uh, another question. Um, so there is, I suppose, there is a possibility that uh, uh, different instances of test R can collide. For example, if one instance uh, uh, creates uh, a form to modify some object on the website and another instance can delete the object. So what is the plan of getting uh, solved this kind of situations? I think you're using, uh, for example, uh, have, talking about an, a content management system. It doesn't really matter. So if you have a list of uh, some kind of entries on the website and you can uh, modify those entries, then several instances of test R can do some kind of action simultaneously and uh, kind of have a collision there. I think that the exactly the same thing would happen in real world. Um, so that wouldn't be a real uh, problem. Uh, but for example, when you mention uh, you're having a uh, content management system and uh, several syst uh, test stars are going to run on the content management system, you should consider that like uh, five, peoples are five people are working on the same site uh, changing it. I think that would never be a feasible uh, idea to do. So in that case, I think uh, it's even a good question whether you want to, par uh, uh, to uh, test it parallel because if you're on the same page changing things, uh, then it's, well, you're always having the, 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 the same problems you always have with a reconciliation of what is the correct version of the page. Um, there's and, another, there's actually another way to do it. Uh, um, if you have a website and maybe you can actually um, launch a separate instance for each test star to test. So then they would not uh, collide. Yes, that, that's certainly a good option. That would be an. Uh... But if we if we talk about a bigger system where you have a number of microservices running in backend, uh, it won't be a feasible option. So then, then maybe the other option is that you actually create a different uh, login accounts for each test R. Then they would uh, edit uh, profiles of different users, basically. So you would add a different test account for each each uh, test star if you want to um, kind of prevent this this kind of uh, colliding. So basically, uh, quality engineer or, or developer who is running test star have to think about it, and there is no technique uh, in a in a in a roadmap to implement, right? No. Um, there could be. Me, at least. Um, there could be possible solution in in a sense that uh, when when RN is finished with the shared um, database, then the colliding will be less probable because uh, if one um, if one of the instances have already tried out some action and published that back to the database, the others will not take that the same one the problem because would that be... has been already executed. But of course if they exactly the same time read the database which does not have this action executed yet then they would they could both pick the same one and, and but even, even, if it's it's a, even if it's a different even if it's a different action so uh, imagine you have a row with the user and ah, true. Yeah, one, one, delete, uh, one, one edit one, yeah. and delete yeah so yeah yeah, yeah sure yeah Still it is you a different, have the yeah. problem then that there's a different state so if one adds uh, and another uh, instance comes from that point uh, and uh, then the new page is a completely new state. You're yeah, in a different are, yeah, state. Matve, you're correct. It, it still is possible to, to collide. Yeah, that, that is that is a thing that has not been really 
considered yet because so far it hasn't been a problem. So now it's a kind of a new challenge we create with this kind of. Um, um, but on, on the other hand, I think that maybe that's something that we should test from the system. <laughs> Well, I think it's very useful to test it, and I think it's an uh, it's a separate math thesis, for example, or at least a lot of development work to research it. Um, and the, the website for where I go, I'm going to apply it is uh, just a portal where users enter and reg register themselves and uh, declare their monthly uh, allowance uh, uh, accountability forms. Uh, so they have a lot of fill-in work, but every user is a separate user. So uh, the test process can be run for 10 times and, and new states can be found anytime. Um, absolutely, absolutely. But in so overall, then the uh, it looks, site it itself looks very, doesn't very impressive. Change. The site yeah, itself doesn't change. It looks very impressive, change. yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I got the idea. Uh, yeah, thank you for presentation. The Actually, uh, this idea of running like multiple agents looks like really good and the implementation looks really uh, amazing. Thank you very much. I have no questions. OK, thank you, Matvey. Um, any other uh, questions? Yeah, I have some uh, questions. Good morning. Yep. Um, you're using uh, the Selenium web driver on, on with Chrome. Um, uh, is it easy to uh, implement other browsers? Uh, yes, in in my case, I uh, used the uh, Docker image. Um, I will go to their image. Where is my visual code? Wait a second. Uh, the Docker file describes what image we are using. Where is my Docker file? Here it should be. Docker, Docker, Docker. Yeah, here it is. And the first line is from Selenium as less standalone Chrome, but Selenium also publish a Firefox image and uh, other images. And another important aspect, and I didn't call it, uh, say it, uh, is you could use um, in Selenium, they have the new, uh, a new technology de developed, uh, which is able to test all machines at once. It's called Selenium Grid, and uh, that would be uh, Selenium. Grid. It's also as well on, on Docker, but what this does is um, you have the client, so our tester yeah. instance, you have a hub, and you have several nodes with all different operating systems. You supply your action to the hub, and the hub will execute it on the nodes. Then but that is scaling up a, 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 a lot, and uh, my machine doesn't have the memory to even try it. <laughs> but you can uh, use, for example, the Apple, the, the Linux, the Windows, and all different kind of uh, browsers on it, as well, using one hub and supplying the actions to there. And then you have all kind of things, all kind of browsers. So there is a lot of more images available. Okay, and, and uh, the Kubernetes, uh, that runs on Linux? Um... It's also other uh, support for other OSs, Windows, uh, Mac. Yes, yes, certainly. Uh, you can run Docker. Uh, Docker has as well. Um, it's all based on Docker, and there is a Docker for Windows, and but there is even the ability to run with Docker Windows images, so that you're not running Linux images but Windows images. And in that case, it was even possible to uh, the the earlier mentioned API to use it on Windows with a Docker instance. But then your Docker instance won't be one gig, but your Docker instance will probably be three or four gigs of mem okay. memory. Um, one one uh, comment for this this approach, uh, having the um, Selenium grid with the hub and all the, all these nodes. I imagine it would become a little bit more difficult to figure out where the error is coming from, <laughs> yes. from their sort of perspective. So maybe uh, maybe this is not the way to do with Testar. But I think we should actually create the the images also for different browsers because it's not uh, that difficult. So basically, having as as we talked already earlier that uh, we would have a Testar Docker dot Selenium Chrome dot selenium um, firefox and so on and then uh, dot appium for example so and we would have thing... a... yep. yeah sorry 
And the only thing so basically you would have a different that... images for different uh, different uh, platforms, but basically the the star code would be the same. Yeah, and the only thing you change is the sit connector value. So in this case, it's a Chrome driver. Then you start with a Firefox driver, and it will be supplied by the Selenium image. So in Selenium, we we provide in the Docker image what kind of image uh, it should use. So when we look in uh, here, uh, we can even go to there, open. Here is Selenium uh, standalone uh, Chrome, uh, but we do have uh, by Selenium a lot more images: standalone Edge, Node Edge, standalone Firefox, uh, Chrome. Uh, fan buses, all, all kind of things needed for Opera is there. The debug versions are there. Um, so there are a lot of versions provided by Selenium already. You can just use. And how much uh, resources do you need uh, per Docker instance or per um, Kubernetes instance? <laughs> that was an uh, interesting question. Um, for, uh, thanks to Fernando, we found out that Chrome is using the shared memory uh, and 64 men, uh, uh, meg megabytes of RAM uh, of memory is not enough shared memory to run such an instance. Um, I was thinking in the first tests that uh, it stopped. My Docker stopped at 512 megabytes, um, but I think it's uh, on a case-to-case -case basis, and it especially has to do with, for example, if you have a lot of JavaScript processing in the Chrome, uh, Chrome or whatever browser, uh, then the memory requirements for the browser itself will grow. And from that point, uh, you need to take into consideration the amount of memory from that point. So you, uh, if you run it on a Docker and you see, OK, uh, in a quarter of an hour uh, and you're on uh, one gig gigabyte of memory, then probably you will need uh, to take into account that you need about one gigabyte of memory per instance. You should see it as you're just running your normal Chrome. Um, However, it's only your Chrome. So, for example, in your task manager, you can see how big your uh, edge is or your um, memory. My edge, for example, is at this moment 650 megabytes. So, take that into account with your tester software itself. So, I would say it's 900 with an edge image. But that depends on what you're doing, and uh, you, you can only look at the only website you're testing and then look at the memory uh, needed for that specific instance. OK, and do you also need special hardware like GPU or? No, no, it is possible. Uh, you can use leverage whatever Kubernetes allows uh, to use, uh, and that's a lot. Um, but for as far as I know, it can just use, uh, it just needs bare uh, calculation, uh, raw calculation speed. It's not supposed. You can, uh, for example, I'm running it in a VM on my Windows. Uh, there is a Docker instance, and from that Docker instance, I'm running my test stars. So it's virtualized again. Uh, well, semi virtualized. The Docker is not completely virtualized. It's a closed uh, part of memory. So it is running inside inside something else and. Uh, that will, of course, have a lot of performance penalty. So when using a native uh, image of Linux and running Docker on it will be a lot faster. And uh, what do you advise? Small uh, Kubernetes nodes or big ones? Uh, the nice thing about Kubernetes is you can just add nodes if you need more. And when you're on, uh, for example, the Azure Cloud, you can even say, well, if I don't have enough nodes, scale up automatically. Yeah, OK, then that has then a cost implication. Yeah, then it has a cost implication. So then it depends on, OK, we we assume we can. Uh, uh, another part of my research will be, OK, uh, can we find a line for an, uh, an asymptotic line from where the uh, amount of adding tester nodes will stop adding to the, fill, uh, to the speed of testing? OK, yeah. Because yeah, at a certain moment, you have an uh, we we uh, suppose you have a website with ten links, we and we uh, deploy ten tester nodes. Then every tester node does one link, but adding twenty doesn't add anything because the, there are ten doing nothing. 
Yeah, well, it's not that simple actually, but uh, but the state model should um, steer the shared state models should steer the these clients to different paths. And of course, when when each of these ten actually fork into yet another paths, then your um, double uh, agents in the same path in the first round would actually split later. So um, yeah, uh, that is something that we have to actually research. How, how, what is the mm -hmm. line when the when adding more clients doesn't actually make make it any faster? But uh, that's it's it's probably not as <laughs> as uh, simple as as you say. No, no, no. But it will will be. Uh, I will take a look at it. Uh, whether we can find something like it. Any other questions? I uh, could it, have a question. Yep. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Really nice, interesting. I'm wondering if you see this architectural model with Docker and Kubernetes scalable to multiple browser versions, because we did talk about different operating systems, but there are requirements within specific companies that would benefit from uh, multiple uh, browsers. I mean, different versions of Chrome, Firefox, and so on. Do you think it could be possible that within the Docker container to have... Look, some at this moment, I have five uh, instances. Yes, that certainly will be possible, because if we create test our uh, Firefox, now I have five instances of Firefox testing, then we add five instances of uh, Chrome, and uh, it's all sharing the database, so from that point on, uh, now 10 images will be started. And if we create the Docker files for Firefox and for Chrome, then uh, those will run at the same time. Yeah, but do you think it could be possible to have, for instance, uh, one operating system with uh, free browsers, for instance, let's say Edge uh, and Chrome and uh, Firefox, for example, and therefore have only one Docker instance with free browsers, therefore. Because I don't know, I think it comes down to the memory and CPU consumption, because if you can run three of them in parallel within the same instance, I think you're you're gonna already gain some some instances at least, because you don't need to make uh, one for each combination. It's going to be madness. Actually, yes, I, I actually this question. might make sense from the other point well, because if we run test star in a way that it makes the same action to three different uh, um, browsers, we can also see if there's difference between the browsers, because we are doing <laughs> this the same is exactly action. this. Yeah, yeah, okay. But this is, of course, another. Yeah, this does it automatically. Yeah, but, but that's then... a bit different because it has different nodes. The Selenium grid has different nodes, and those may be other uh, virtual machines uh, in itself. Or oh, you can skip this one. This machines. one. Machines. No, but the the thing here is that um, um, if we uh, use the Selenium grid in between, probably we cannot get the. Um, result as clearly from the test star's perspective. So basically, then test star doesn't know where the error comes from. Well, I don't know. Maybe that's also possible. Uh, yeah, we haven't but really looked into the implementation. Maybe both options are possible. But I think this this uh, this idea has has interesting um, interesting idea in this in the sense that we could actually if we to minimize the, the instances, for, you know, because you cannot grow infrastructure. Uh, all the time, whenever you have a new version of the browser, for instance. And yeah, the sure. same goes for operating systems also. If we talk about mobile, I know this is uh, an example for web, but if we talk about mobile and Android market, which is extremely fragmented one, then you have so many combinations that, well, only to think about it, it's, it's almost insane. 
in, in I my understand. opinion. And the, the biggest problem so with it... So it has to be some smart way to maybe limit the, the test so that we have a good enough coverage with as little instances as possible to, to save uh, money at least. Yes, I understand what you mean. And uh, running multiple test stars because you are going to run uh, or a single test star on, uh, you want to minimize the Docker uh, instances. Uh, and this is just built around the fact, uh, the idea that uh, we don't have to change the software itself to support multiple uh, browsers from one instance. So, um, when you have multiple instances from one browser, then or you have to run three test stars or one test star doing the same over three instances, uh, no, over three different browsers in the same image, uh, then you should as well uh, re uh, rebuild the complete test star software itself to support the different results from the different browsers. So you have one test star node uh, maintaining three browsers, and that will, will uh, incur a big uh, architectural change for test star itself. Well, might might not be that big as you think. I don't know. At least from from the outside, without knowing too much about Testar, uh, it it looks at least doable and uh, quite uh, quite interesting to have such approach that you can control the way Testar runs as a as a is utilizing a single uh, system under test or multiple like multiple browsers, for instance, and. Actually, uh, theoretically, at least it seems that it's just a matter of how you collect the data that you really map the actions to the correct browser that you've been using. I don't know. I might sound simple. Yes, that, that is right. <laughs> You're right in that uh, in that point of view. Uh, but uh, there's actually also... there's a, a, a product called WebMate, which is actually um, specifically done for finding the cross browser differences. Um, it, I'm not sure. I, I don't think it's open source. Um, they did uh, publish papers on it, but I think in the end they made the product commercial. But in any case, um, uh, I, I think in cross-browser uh, testing there is already uh, existing tools for that. Um, but on the other hand, I think still the idea is kind of interesting. But uh, yeah, it requires a little bit more work, I think, and it's out of scope oh, well, of for, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Of course, definitely. Just throwing the idea. Of course. All right, but at least from me, no other questions. Thank you again for the presentation. Yeah, thank you. If I may ask one more question, maybe it's not uh, directly related to the work which was presented, but uh, what is the process in Testar to release new features. I noticed that the latest master branch of Testar is was updated quite a long time ago. So how it works? Um, the master branch is not that old. I think it's... Or am, 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 I, am I mistaken maybe then? 17 days uh, seems to be the last, last um, yeah. merge into master. So, oh, so okay, basically... Okay, maybe. Yeah, maybe. yeah, so it might be that you've been looking at the binaries. Um, we haven't, I, I don't think the, well, Fernando is in the call, I think. So um, do we actually publish the uh, latest binaries automatically or is it done separately from the, uh, the build process? So the, um, in the web page of Testar, we are doing manually. Yeah. 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 Ah, okay, so that's updated manually, okay. Yeah. But this, we have also the latest, latest version. So what maybe because we have ah, yeah, 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 in sure. somewhere we have like a old tester repository. So maybe sometimes if you are trying to find the tester GitHub web page, sometimes you are finding this old repository. Ah, that's probably the reason. So it's a, a web browser cache or something like that. I don't know. Um, no, no, no. Look, there is a there's GitHub another repo. tester. Yeah, the, there is another tester, which is called ah, tester tool. Ah, that's the so. old repository. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. So then you have been okay. That's possible. And, and I, I know that tester has been forked a couple of times as well. Well, it's not a fork. It's a, like a master repository. It's, it's the old old version. Yeah. Okay, I see. Probably. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, you have to use start. 
this time master is, is being um, um, yeah uh, we are um, merging the pull request as as uh, as fast as we can in a, in a sense so of course we try to test them first and uh, see that nothing breaks okay okay got it but yeah maybe that that was the confusion from our side that we were looking into the old repository and maybe try to do something with the code there but yeah okay now it's clear thank you yeah, I know that at least Sorin is now uh, running the latest, as far as I know. <laughs> yes, he is. Yep. Yeah, seems, seems so. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. I, have, I have another question. Yep. Um, uh, I have an environment where I have like 128 gigabytes of memory available and about 20 cores. How many Kubernetes nodes would you uh, advise uh, to divide it up? I would first say, well, let's start with 10 and then look at the speed, what it's doing. Uh, what, uh, what I especially encounter is IO operations are slow in my case. So uh, it's not the memory, which is my problem, uh, because I'm able to run about 30, uh, 30 images, but my test star will time out because it takes too long to uh, uh, even fully boot it up. So, uh, the images are created, it takes a lot of time, but then the I.O. is my main problem, so not the, the memory itself. <coughs> but the disks and access to uh, to, uh, to the user interface uh, and CPU loading, but that will probably because my laptop is running Windows and on it I'm running a virtual machine, and that has also uh, limitations. Because in my node, you have here a view of your nodes, and I'm running it on Minikube. But here is the amount of pods I can run, the memory limits, the CPU limits, and uh, there are limits everywhere, as well supposed uh, by um, opposed by uh, Kubernetes itself on the hardware. So it says, well, I'm not going to allow you to run this much, uh, and I think there is my virtual machine between it, my Windows subsystem between it, uh, limiting it. And when you really have a, a, a clear, clean cluster with Linux, uh, yeah, well, and just, we then it will a, probably uh, be faster. We, we're using VMware ES, ESXi, so we have uh, where we now run our uh, virtual machines, and I want to uh, make our own uh, Kubernetes cluster for, for testing. So yeah, 128 gigabyte of memory is, uh, is available and uh, about 20 cores. Well, that would be very uh, good to start. Very good. Uh, I think, yes, start at least with 10 or 15 instances at once. And uh, probably uh, you should make the test runs longer in your settings. Um, and it has especially to do with you don't want to, to finish it in three minutes because then you don't have any clue about, okay, it's already finished. So if you do make a test run long enough, you can as well look in the pods, uh, the usage of memory. Uh, so you have a clue about, okay, uh, this is it about going to do. Otherwise, you don't know anything at all. If it's running in, uh, in, in three minutes, well, the tester node will stop as soon as it's completed. <laughs> then it's cleaned up and you're not able to exit into it anymore. So you're not able to see anything anymore. So you want to have a decent long run, uh, decent long runs to see how much it's really consuming. And starting with 10 instances, uh, and monitoring the server resources itself, then you can see whether uh, how much you can scale up. I don't know okay. it. I don't know at this moment. It's just a trial and error. About okay, uh, what I what, what I've seen is it takes about a gigabyte of memory uh, each instance with Chrome and the Open University website, which has uh, sliders on it and all kind of media stuff. There, there is also on uh, Kubernetes recommendation for clusters regarding hardware, and I think uh, it's something like master node two two gigs of memory and one point five core CPU, and then the the worker nodes to have a bit under uh, one gig and uh, half of core CPU or something like that. You can start for, from a very low. Uh, you can start very low. I, my first Kubernetes machine was two gigabytes, and well, no, my master is one gigabyte of memory, and my first node was about four gigabytes of memory, and it could already run three instances, but not with Testar, but with other software. Um, that was just for testing, 
and then I've seen, okay, it takes a lot of memory, and if you want to do something useful, uh, and the Kubernetes cluster itself takes as well several pods, um, so you're going to about uh, four at minimum, and then eight or 16, um, and going up is better. Firewall considerations, oh, wait a second, it's not, it doesn't even have. Hardware specifications. Automatic. It doesn't have a real description about uh, what you want to set up. In uh, Azure, you have the ability to, see, to use a virtual machine and they just recommend almost any type. Okay. I'm also curious about setting up a Kubernetes cluster specifically for the Tessa program. Uh, from what I've heard till now, the, the biggest bottleneck is I.O. With that you mean how, how much you can write to a disk and read from disk, right? Yes, that's what, I've, you, uh, what I meant, I've seen. Would you recommend uh, creating a couple of big nodes with a lot of uh, different disk attached so that we can write more to uh, different drives without having to buy a lot of uh, smaller machines? Or would you recommend buying a lot of smaller machines, setting them in a Kubernetes cluster and running uh, Testar on uh, different machines at once? As an example, only two instances per a small machine with one CPU core and uh, two gigabytes of RAM. Well, CPU cores is something Kubernetes is going to limit you uh, really strong on. Uh, Kubernetes just says, well, if you have one CPU, then I'm not uh, willing to run more than so many uh, pods. Uh, exactly. So CPU is, CPU is an important thing, uh, the amount of cores. And if it's fast, that doesn't, uh, it's, it's, it's less important than the amount I've seen. Um, but for Testar specifically, because I'm, I did set up uh, several Kubernetes clusters in the past, but in my experience, it is also important what are you going to upload on the Kubernetes cluster, which applications do you host on it? And in this case, I'm mostly curious about uh, the different types of workloads that Tester provides. The CPU, if there's less, it's, it's just slower, but uh, that is not really a problem for a test cluster. Uh, the RAM has to be correct, and for that I can simply test it on my local machine on the web browser to see how many, how much RAM it uses uh, yep. at 50% and allocate that. But for the disks, if it's uh, already showing that uh, the IOPS are not enough on a local machine, then I'm curious about how many drives is it allocated to the cluster and whether it uh, may be better to just uh, get a couple of small clusters or small uh, nodes on a large cluster and uh, host Testar in that way. What, what, uh, what I further more, uh, what, in, in a website there is several things which are uh, relevant. Uh, it's for example uh, your network speed. Yeah. Um, your network speed, your website is loading, so every time you send a request and at that moment the system is doing nothing. So, um, in that case, it's it's low CPU bound. It it's, doesn't use a lot of CPU. It's still waiting for the network page to load. Then it renders. That will be a bigger part of the uh, CPU at that moment. Then Testar will do its uh, things around it. So getting a complete uh, a document structure and uh, get all the actions from it and perform a new action. Then performing a new action will start the cycle over again. So uh, it's network bound. Uh, it's a bit of uh, I, uh, network uh, disk bound. What what I especially see is if I start ten uh, instances on my disk. Oh well, I can show it. I can show the difference. Uh, what uh, type of the, disk do you have so that I can do an a SSD. Bit of resource? It's an SSD. Uh, one thing that comes into mind is that um, we could actually affect that. So uh, now we are still uh, creating uh, files as as reports these HTML files and all yeah. those things. So we could actually uh, disable the writing file reports, actually. That might make it faster in a sense of I.O. Yes, but I'm not writing files to my local disk. I write, write them to network. Uh, yeah, that changes a little bit, yeah. 
So uh, everything in my case, I don't run my own uh, network uh, NFS file system on my own uh, disk, so it's over a VPN. Uh, so that's also affecting it. Uh, there are several things affecting the speed in my setup. Um, the uh, database I didn't use it, but is also on another machine, and I'm on Wi-Fi at this moment. So there are several factors. Uh, uh, which are not the most optimal. Uh, running it on an Azure uh, crystal, for example, is dedicated hardware, uh, which is way faster, of course. Yeah. And, um, well, results will also differ depending on how your network infrastructure is set up and uh, everything around it. Uh, but seeing that it uh, performed 15 actions within uh, three minutes or something uh, on five instances, but I can show you if I change it. And we will just change this. Let's just do a simple test. We we add uh, 20 instances. An instance. Uh, and we limit the amount of actions. And that's what I want to show you. Uh, if I limit the amount of actions, the only the boot up will take that much longer even if the image is on my disk already. And that's one of the things, the bottlenecks I've come across. So we set this up, ah, it already has a short sequence length. I modified it for that one. So we execute it right now. And now the job is starting again. And we have 10 instances, pending, creating, we have task manager as well. SSD is not that big. Is it the SATA or an NVMe? Uh, it's an M2. M2, M NVMe, okay. Uh, I just also changed this one. This doesn't exist. Job deleted. What's gone? Cleaning that up. It's as you see all uh, based on uh, completely based on the configuration in this file. I just made a change one. Okay, so okay, now we've created a new one, and we look at the disk. Well, disk is not that big. It's already running, and when we see it now. Uh, and we set refresh on. Then it, it tells you the time it takes before the SUT is becoming ready. And, and the more instances you add, the longer that takes, specifically that action. So when I run it in one, then uh, it's in uh, about under two seconds. And when I run it in 10 times, it's four seconds or even longer. And we will see it right now. All actions are taking longer at this point. While my CPU isn't even that high. So the image is there, it's loaded, and still it's not taking the maximum of my system. And you see a lot of network traffic on the Wi-Fi. Yeah, I think uh, there are many places we can optimize this. Uh, Matve, do you still have one question? 
Yes. Um, so about reporting. So if you disable uh, HTML reporting, is it possible later on to recreate those reports from the database? It strongly depends whether you want to keep your database. Uh, in my case, I don't want to keep it. Uh, because I, everyone want to have a clean run and want to know, okay, is the system still running and uh, working as expected? So I don't want to compare it or something. I just want to have every day the results. Um, but uh, if you keep the database, uh, we don't store at this moment errors in the database, but it would will be can be extended. But, what about uh, what about uh, screenshots? Are they stored somewhere else than on the disk? No, they are stored on disk. Currently, yeah. Okay. Okay, I see. Thanks. So you see a lot of CPU uh, using, so it's not a problem running 10 instances at this moment. It's only taking a long time before even doing something. Look, it took me 15 seconds before uh, starting. And when using the half of the uh, images, it was only four seconds. So I think there is some I/O there. Yeah, I think uh, this is something we could we could try to look into later. Uh, is how to optimize it also to to run run it on on this way. But um, I think it will always remain specific to the situation where you're applying it. I have a lot of network infrastructure between it. Uh, Kubernetes will uh, by default uh, add a lot of network infrastructure to it. Um, and the kind of storage you want to use is uh, important. Uh, you can, for example, uh, Kubernetes has the ability to store it on any kind of storage. So. Uh, this. These are all kind of storage things you can use. iSCSI, Quobyte, NFS, RBD, vSphere, fee volumes, portworks, and it, then it writes directly to it. Azure files, Azure disks, AVS, Elastic Plug stores. So there are a lot of possibilities to, to store what you want, and, and that's not specific to test art, but will impact uh, performance probably in a certain way. Does the program start up faster when you mount a, uh, a, a, a local disk instead of a network disk? Um, because what this feels to me is that it reads the protocol files from the network uh, drive and that it then compiles it on all 20 instances and that something like that could be the cause of the slowdown because in your network tab you did see that it was reading uh, 25 megabytes a second at times, and maybe it has to do with reading it from a uh, remote server instead of um, something similar. Yes, that could be a uh, yes, that could be a reason. Uh, it's only reading the Java file from uh, the uh, network and the test settings file. Yeah. It's the only two files. It stores the compiled version on the local Docker image itself. Okay. So it doesn't write it back. But after the initial startup, after the SUT was started up, it did go faster, right? Only the yes, yep. slowdown was initially. Yeah. Okay. And I also tried to uh, look in it, into it myself to uh, see whether I can find something. What you see here is as well 16 seconds before it was uh, accessible. And uh, I'm just going to put it down to two, and uh, the results are changing very much. Uh, where is my Orient DB file? Just change it to two. Okay, no, even one. Why should we do two, one? And we complete it. It took uh, for the 10 instances, it took three minutes 37. Now we didn't change anything furthermore. It's running already. And times I saw then was uh, around four seconds. And 
that's big, be a lot better. CPU is a little bit lot lower right now. As you see, in uh, if I use 10 instance, I was around 30% CPU, and now I'm only 13. But that's a lot more for one instance than for 10 instances. In comparison. Pretty slow. Oh, I have to auto-refresh. Yeah, now it is. 508 milliseconds. Oh, yeah. So this is the biggest change I've seen between scaling up. But this is all on one node. So if I do nodes, for example, then I think this will change a lot. And I do have two nodes available, but uh, they're in my in the data center and having not too much and are way slower than my laptop. Um, then I can test several things on that as well, but didn't do that yet. But you see, it's very quick in that case, and it's already done. So when we look at this task, this ta task took only 25 seconds. Well, 10 tasks, uh, 250. 10 tasks were faster than one task. Do you see? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. So I there think is a lot are... of, uh, of of uh, investigating there about what what is uh, the correct amount of memory and uh, network setup. Um, it really depends. Any yeah. other um, urgent questions? We are a little bit over time already. I think. <laughs> If not, uh, I'll thank you, Arendt, for the presentation and demo. It was uh, very good. And I think, uh, as you can see, it, it uh, was very interesting for many people. So so uh, let's uh, also, in our side, we try to get the Docker uh, into the master so that we would uh, automatically publish uh, also the uh, uh, Docker image. The Chrome version at first, I think. Yeah, at least uh, at least one first. Yeah, we can we can build others later, but at least one of them. Okay, thank you very much, and um, I wish you a good day. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.